to the dentist. We have, no, we're newly right, but that's our plan. Okay, great. So. <laughs> um, as, as far as dental visit, what I was explaining earlier to Pam is don't be afraid of that initial preventive care. I know sometimes there are stressors that you guys, you know, I, I can only imagine what your days end up like sometimes and, and things like that, that we are here to answer questions. We are here to try to simplify things. So um, as far as getting to the dentist and having that preventive care and going every six months, our job is to make it easy to educate you guys, to show you techniques, to really, really help um, assess your needs, your individual needs on what's going to help you at home. Um, so hopefully Ali and I can, you know, answer questions this evening, um, it's some concerns that you guys have, but primarily as far as that, has your, has your son been to the dentist before, just not here? Exactly. That's okay, right. just yeah. not here. And um, as far as dental visits go, um, yeah. routine care every six months, just just like a normal individual as far as in a sense of, you know, what is recommended for children and adults, we all recommend the same every six months. However, at our office, our philosophy is there are intermittent visits that are sometimes needed. Those are basically just happy visits where you can come in, so please feel free and let us know if this is something that you would feel would work, um, where you can come in and just familiarize yourself with the dental office, familiarize yourself with the staff and your child as well. Um, just come in and, and feel comfortable, maybe sit in the chair, not even necessarily do anything that's going to, you know, be of treatment wise. Um, just coming in and becoming familiar and seeing things, touching things, feeling things, and then that's it. And then we come back again. Um, and we, we try to ease and, and work into the appointments to make children feel as comfortable as possible. Um, there are often times where we recommend more frequent visits. Sometimes maybe oral hygiene at home um, isn't, you know, at a tip-top level. And there are struggles. Even I face struggles with my nine-year-old daughter who refuses to brush. Um, we may make recommendations where we see you guys every three months. And that's just more so because... When we see you more often, even though I know it sounds like, oh my gosh, I've got to go to the dentist four times a year, it's so we can catch things early on. Because when we catch things early on, it's so much easier to treat. Um, so in with that, to talk about, I kind of want to lead into how can you guys try to catch things at home? What are you guys looking for at home? Um, hi, hi, how are you? Have a seat. I can move out of the way. I can move more down here. Um, <coughs> Brushing, flossing at home, I want to be able to talk about different techniques that you guys can use and approach. Are all of you able to brush pretty well at home and your children able to get in there and brush and do it twice a day? I know that's ideal, twice a day, morning and night. Um, flossing sometimes can be a struggle. Do we all see issues with uh, struggles with flossing? And I'm Courtney, by the way. This is Alex. Yeah. So well, hi. <laughs> um, what type of struggles do you guys see at home? With, with either brushing or flossing. So we can make sure and demonstrate some techniques and, and also guide you guys on, you know, what you're looking for at home. Do you, I'm, are you guys okay with brushing? Or? We had a fantastic program at Baca. Uh -huh. And I'm gonna brag on my son now and Baca. That we went to the dentist for the first time in several years with my son. And the dentist looked at his teeth and said, oh, it's great. They're looking good. That's and they a good job of keeping them and that was just, I felt so proud. No, and you should. Yeah, that's a huge accomplishment. Yeah. Huge accomplishment to get that feedback. Because I will tell you this, even Dr. Anna, I don't give her good grades. You know? <laughs> so to, to get that feedback from a dentist to reassure you that you guys are doing. And here's the thing. We all have struggles. We, we do. I mean, we all have struggles. We don't expect you guys to, to be perfect. So that, that's fabulous. I want, I want you to know that wasn't anything. <laughs> so my, it was but you still felt my like son her. learned it <laughs> and, at, at Barker and I just played a little role at home in just, just making sure the bathroom was sure. set up for him to just do same it way the way he they so that it's a routine and exactly he he can do it and Yay. the range of like the products that you have available in the United States to keep your teeth clean is fantastic and you, 
it was it took a long time, but it was really worth putting the effort into getting that to independence. That's yeah. great. I mean, yeah. that I think that says a lot as well. You know, yeah, and just in, really incorporating yeah. programs. You probably to, did toothbrushing with Jimmy. I did. Yeah. 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 To yeah. develop yeah. that yeah. skill set. Yeah. Yeah. To, to do that. Well, that's great. Yes. So, if you guys ever have any questions or concerns, but I, if, I mean, does brushing go well, well for you? How my I'm, daughter, I just, I tend to do it, and she just plays around with my son. We let him do it first, and then and you guys he do, Yeah, he does the front, and I'll, I watch him to see where he's doing it. He's always just doing the front, and then I'll take the toothbrush and say, "Did you get back here?" And he tells me he did, but I know he didn't. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. I don't know if that'll just come with time, you know. It will. It will come with time. And, you know, every child is different with learning their dexterity of their hands. And, for instance, my daughter does great at the back, but she has a really hard time getting the front. Um, here's a little tip when you're at home. And a lot of times, I don't know if this will kind of help incorporate mm -hmm. with, with your teaching mm -hmm. here as well. Children always like to put their teeth together when they brush their teeth. And when they put their teeth together, they're biting like this. Oh, sorry, my little mouth here. They're biting like this, and then a lot of times they do the back and forth. Well, you can see my toothbrush isn't touching the bottom teeth at all. So we see a lot of times that the top teeth might look okay. Even though we recommend circles to move in circles, they're doing this. And they're brushing. So if we can initially start off and tell them to open their mouth a little bit and let's focus on just doing all of our top teeth. Let's watch the toothbrush get our top teeth only. We want it to cover the pink part and our tooth. And go and start, you know what, if we're brushing back and forth at this point, that's fine. But we see a lot of times a lot of gingivitis on the bottom. We get the tartar buildup more so on the bottom because we have a salivary gland on the floor of our mouth. So we get that tartar buildup behind that if, you, if we can focus a little bit more on, let's open the mouth to brush our teeth as opposed to doing this. Does that make sense? Yes. So hopefully that's a little tip that okay. will improve oral hygiene at home by, by doing that. Sometimes as well, I recommend holding down the lip. Pull the lip down and brush to get really good because we, this muscle, our chin muscle here, um, can be very, very tight and another little tip for you, and we brought this size so I can show you guys. Kids want to feel big by using a big toothbrush, by an adult toothbrush. You know, sometimes they want to graduate from the character toothbrushes and things like that. To be honest with you, I find the smaller the toothbrush, the better. Because we're, it allows the nooks and the crannies to get, you know, it's very small, so it's going to sneak in places where a larger toothbrush may not. Mm -hmm. So, the smaller the toothbrush, the better. Um, it's not as big and bulky. A, a lot of times, when, with this chin muscle, the chin muscle gets very, very tight, so we're limited to getting the bottom. But even if they open too big, then our cheeks can restrict how far back the toothbrush gets, and then we find that we're not getting way back, you know, the teeth way back on the sides. So my recommendation is just always trying to teach, let's open our mouth, let's just focus on the top teeth. I always like to sing ABCs as well. I don't, you know, the ABC is a great song, and I say let's do all the ABCs before we even move to the next, if you can. I mean, this is just kind of a, a guiding tool. You know, I don't know if focusing on the ABCs will allow that focus to keep going. So you start A here, but you don't end Z until here. That way they're trying to go around really, really slow and singing the ABCs. So that might be a little tip, you know, that can work for you at home. Um, do any of you find any struggles at home? We'll talk about flossing here in a minute, but, you know, getting way back in the back. Uh, do your children primarily brush by themselves or are you getting in there and helping? And He's doing it himself. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, the job's not that great. So <laughs> you know what? That's it. good. That's and good. And now I'm in there, but I, I do what you just mentioned. I pull the lip down and I pull the cheek out. Will you sit first? Yes, yeah. And I'll show. Okay, so um, as a parent, and 
you know, you're watching your child and you're making sure that they're brushing good and you're like, good job. And then you want to take a turn and you want to get in there as well and, you know, just kind of do the best you can really quick with the five mm -hmm. seconds you may have. So something I want to show you today, coming from the front doesn't allow you to reach everywhere by any means. I always recommend sitting down, whether it be in a chair, whether it be if you're doing it in the bathroom, sitting down sideways on the toilet. So if this were the toilet, sitting down sideways, that way you can kind of straddle the toilet. And then have them tilt their head back. That way it kind of replicates like at a dental office. Your vision, and you can see so much more this way. If, you, if you're able to do it this way, this is great. It allows you to get, sorry, thank you, Adam. You're okay. It allows you to get the back teeth so much better because you're not gonna get the back teeth good enough coming from the front. It's just, you just really mm -hmm. can't. You can do a much better job from behind. Um, so brushing from behind, well, flossing from behind for that yes. matter. Flossing from behind, if we can move to flossing. I know flossing is challenging. <coughs> it's challenging for me <laughs> to get it done. Um, the little flossers on a stick are great. Um, so trying to reach the front teeth is really, really good. Um, to teach flossing, I'm going to show you guys a little trick. Do you work on flossing here at all? I yes, that's good. Yeah. That's a good question because yes. I was like, you know, we should. <laughs> if we don't, there's good. a lot of a lot of flossing aids that you can buy with the longer handles. Here's what I find with that is it's really good until you have to start turning it at a different angle and then figuring out how to get it in the back teeth. It's great for the front teeth because you can just go up and down, um, you know, or for the top ones. If your child has dexterity, that's pretty good, and you can assist with this, I like to take the floss, and I like to tie it in a circle, and I'll show you why. Sorry, it's very slippery. Well, maybe. Okay, don't use glide floss. <laughs> Just teasing. Um, my fingers are kind of slippery. I like to tie it to where there's a circle. The, the key to flossing is keeping your fingers and your thumb fairly close so you can control the floss to go up. So if they have something to hold on to, like this, to put their fingers, they're not trying to hold it way out here because the floss is this long. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So now, and I would do a little bit of a smaller circle than this right here, but um, so this is a technique to be able to teach the dexterity and, and work um, with, with flossing by holding with the thumb and the finger. It's just by holding a circle. If I'm flossing and I do the same thing with a circle, it's actually easy because I've got a hold of it and I can guide my thumb by pushing the floss where it needs to go because I've got my fingers around here as well as opposed to doing all this. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, our time's mm -hmm. limited sometimes, so we don't have time to sit here and do this. Um, so we can just move around the floss and push with our thumb and finger and keep going in the circle. So that's just kind of a little tip, maybe that might help you out of home or not. Um, well, brushing and flossing. I find a lot toothpaste. Who uses toothpaste? Okay, good. I know a lot of times there are some sensory issues with the taste of toothpaste, the texture of toothpaste. Um, I personally had a struggle with that with my daughter, um, not wanting to use toothpaste at all. Just, we couldn't find a toothpaste flavor. So a little tip that you can do, um, if, there, if that were to be an issue, is you don't have to use toothpaste to brush. I mean, toothpaste is great for fluoride. Um, if you choose a fluoridated toothpaste, um, but just moistening the, the toothbrush with a rinse, whether it be an antimicrobial rinse like Listerine, um, so you get a little bit of an antimicrobial effect where it helps kill the bacteria that causes gingivitis and things like that. Or if you would like a fluoride rinse, um, using a fluoride rinse. So it's not necessarily the toothpaste that's getting the teeth clean, it's more the toothbrushing action itself. That might be cost, more cost effective in our household because we go through a lot of toothpaste. A half a tube every morning <laughs> and every night. We go through there you go. Yeah. 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 But so those, this, those have like dyes in them though, right? Oh, goodness. See, that's the oil. <laughs> that's a very good question. <laughs> and that recommend, yeah, Tom's, um, I would just recommend doing water, you know. If, but if you use Tom's and you're having great yeah. success with it, stick with Tom's. I mean, Tom's is a great product. Um, I just wanted to throw out some other options to right. get a benefit um, as opposed to using a toothpaste. Oh, we go through um, a lot of toothpaste. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, and you, you know, you don't have to use toothpaste at all. You, I, I much rather work on brushing two to three times a day, and if you can incorporate that third time, I like the structure of you do it in the morning. I'm sure you guys have maybe a calendar or a chart, a checkoff list of here are things that need to be done every day, or just establishing that routine. Do it in the morning. I try to incorporate do it as we get home from school. We do it then as well because we ate all day long. Um, which that poses me or brings me to the next topic. We'll talk about diet and stuff um, at school and things that we can that we can do and how cavities form because there's a misconception. Um, it's more so how often a person eats is really what increases a risk. I mean, we're, we all like our candy and stuff like that, but it's the frequent snacking all day long that causes our mouth to be in an acidic level, and I'll touch base on that here in a second. Um, where was I going with that? The, the two piece of dice. Oh, yeah. So, it, brushing three times a day, if you can incorporate that third time a day, just because we may not, we, I'm sure we're missing areas in the morning, so maybe that that middle middle brushing right after school and before bed or right after dinner. Um, I know before bed, that bedtime routine can be a little crazy sometimes, so if you can do it more so after dinner, that would be great as well. Um, yes? I have a question about the flossing. Yes. I'm always nervous. I don't do it because I'm nervous about Your fingers. Oh, very good. So yeah. is it possible to hurt them by putting it up too far? Very good question. Um, Okay, so here's an alley. Feel free to chime in. Okay. I like to think of it this way. If you're using the right flossing technique, and I know there's not much here to show, the ultimate goal of flossing is, yes, getting it up and pushing so it forms a C shape around, around the tooth, okay? So when we're flossing, putting it in between and kind of pulling so it creates a C shape and then moving up and down. If we have any gum tissue infection, any inflammation, any gingivitis, it's going to be sore and it's going to hurt. And a lot of people are like, ow, you hurt me, you made me bleed. Well, yeah, I did. Sorry, you know, but it's bleeding more so because of the gingivitis and, and the bacteria that's stuck up there. So it's kind of, you know, we're, we're doing good, but there's also, we're at a loss because we have to do it to get the bacteria out to improve the gum tissue health. Um, are you going to do damage? No, just don't push forcefully. Um, so if you can do it gently, do you have to make that C-shape? It's recommended, but even if you're getting up there and pulling out the plaque and bacteria, you're doing good. You're, you're getting that benefit. Does everybody floss perfectly? No, and I can tell you I don't because half the time I'm in a rush and I'm going up, 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 and I'm moving around because I'm trying to floss in a hurry, but at least I know I flossed. If we're human, <laughs> you know, we, we're not going to get it perfect. So, yes, it can hurt. If you see any type of bleeding with flossing, don't think that you did something wrong. More than likely, it's just a little bit of gingivitis, and everybody gets gingivitis. It, it, we all have it. Um, it's just to what degree we have it. Um, you know, our gum tissue may look perfect one day, but we could have had a popcorn kernel stuck up there, which causes gum tissue inflammation, so we have gingivitis in that area until we get that out. So that's a great question. Are you going to do damage? No, I mean, be, be gentle with it. Um, yes, there are ligaments up in that sulcus and everything that you, you know we don't want to damage by trying to go too far. Like, let's see how far the floss can go up there. When you feel that, you know, that click, does everybody know the little <laughs> click I'm talking about? That's that's why we are flossing, is to get past that point to grab any plaque and bacteria to pull it right back out. So when you hear that snap or you feel that on your fingers, um, you, you've gone good enough <laughs> so you can pull it back down. And some, some teeth are just really challenging to get in between, so that's a great question. But the other thing I was going to add too is like she was saying earlier, when you come from behind, I feel like you don't have to use as much force, force. or pressure. <laughs> When versus when you're doing it from the front, you really have to push to get it up past that click point. So mm -hmm. really coming from behind and helping them is going to be huge too with not putting too much pressure to slam it into their gums. Does anybody use um, an electric toothbrush? Great. No, that's great. I was going to say that that's a great option. You know, some children like it, some children don't like it. Um, it's a great tool if it's used correctly. 
um, it, and it really can help stimulate the gum tissue as far as to really be able to massage the gum tissue and, and stimulate it. So if, if your child is open and doesn't have a lot of sensory issues and they enjoy that, um, I recommend it. I recommend it more for an older child. Our philosophy is, kind of, is you don't really want to teach somebody how to use a calculator if they don't know how to do basic math. You want to wait until they learn basic math first <laughs> because they still have to learn how to place the toothbrush in the right areas. That's the main goal. However, using an electric toothbrush does have some perks and benefits to it. And especially because some toothbrushes, the, the, the pulsating action of the bristles, this kind of sounds gross, but it uses your saliva to really flush things out from in between your teeth. So you're getting, you're getting a higher benefit there as well. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Any concerns with it at all at home or using it? Or, um, I mean, it doesn't work no. out well? I mean, they do, they have to do a lot of like, pushing it so she gets back to the back. Uh -huh. But we do a lot of counting. That's that great. Seems to work yeah, for counting her. and ABCs. Yeah. I mean that's those are great methods to use at home, you know, just to for the longevity so you know you're getting long enough. Right. That's another good thing about the electric toothbrushes is a lot of them have timers on them. Ooh, so nice. you can you can promote you brush till it stops or you brush to the beep. We're doing this area till it beeps, then you move this area till the next beep. So, you know, there's there's definitely perks to it. So that's great. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about our school day, our eating habits, and really what causes cavities. Because ultimately that's what we're trying to prevent here is cavities. That way we're not coming into the dentist more frequently and, and having to go through procedures. Um, so as far as diet goes, there's a lot of factors that can contribute um, to cause cavities. Several factors need to be present. I mean, obviously a tooth, um, sugar, or any type of carbohydrate, um, and, and the amount of time that your tooth is exposed for the acid to um, erode the tooth to, you know, to cause a cavity. It's, like I said earlier, remember it's more the frequency of snacking. It's snacking all day long. Every time we take a drink of something, every time that we eat something that has sugar in it, even, even the fake sugars, um, or that is a carbohydrate that breaks down into the form of a sugar, we have bacteria in our mouth and that bacteria feeds off of that sugar. Um, and we're constantly getting bacteria in our mouth. That's, that's why we're brushing. We're trying to keep the plaque away and trying to reduce the amount of bacteria in our mouth. Um, the bacteria feeds off of the sugars that we put in our mouth and then it produces an acid. That acid in turn is what breaks down our enamel. So every time we eat something or drink something, it literally takes about 20 minutes for our mouth to do what it needs to do to neutralize back out at that neutral level. In that 20 minutes, if we've taken another drink or if we've taken another bite, we're not allowing our mouth to neutralize back out to where we're at a happy level. Instead, we're at a cavity mode level. Does that make sense? So the more we eat and snack all day long or we drink things all day long, our mouth isn't being neutralized at all. So we're just increasing a chance to, to have cavities because we're always in that acid mode. And then that acid over time is just gonna break down, break down, break down, and then we're gonna have areas of cavities. So that brings me to what do we look for at home? What can you guys see at home that is to the point of um, areas where we would say, we need to watch this. This is an area of concern. So our teeth are typically whitish, yellowish. Don't mind this picture. I, this is called demineralization. I don't know if everybody can see it. You guys see the white mm -hmm. spots here? Mm -hmm. That's because a person with braces didn't really brush, maybe didn't have the best diet, didn't remove the plaque off of the teeth, and the longer that plaque stays on the teeth, obviously the plaque has bacteria. We're eating, we're drinking. The sugars feed off that bacteria, produce the acid to, you know, eat away at the enamel, and then we, we get areas like this. This is the initial phase of a cavity. So if we ever see anything right here, like the white spots on the tooth here, um, it's not because the teeth are starting to get really, really white for some reason. It's actually the reverse. It's because it's the, the initial phase of the tooth enamel breaking down. So this is just a visual for you guys. Yes. Is that um, a spot on the tooth as such, or can that be removed by cleaning? This cannot. Or I like to say it's this not. is almost like a scar. Uh -huh. It's almost like if you, you know, if you had an abrasion 
and now you have a scar, or if you had a surgery and now you have a scar. This will not go away on its own. Are there aesthetic procedures that can be done for very minor areas of decalcification? Yes, there are. That can be done in office, and that's called microabrasion. And think of it like microdermabrasion for your face, where you really, you know, they, they really just kind of go in with roughness and smooth out your skin. We do the same thing. We, we take some, um, it, it's a whole um, regimen of procedures as far as, but it's very painless, it's very easy, it's, it's done in the chair. We roughen up the enamel a little bit. Um, we put a lot of calcium phosphate on the tooth, so an MI paste, which is fluoride free, but it has a lot of calcium phosphate in there, and we send you home with some, or we send the patient home with some to use, um, to apply with a Q-tip in that area or whatever. This is a pretty extreme case of decalcification. But there are, there are ways that we can fix this um, to help make it not as noticeable. But this is something that you guys can look for at home. If you see a spot like this, you know, it's, it's a spot of concern that I wouldn't want you to wait, you know, and be like, oh, it's okay, you know, or maybe we miss our appointment because we do that too. I miss appointments too sometimes, you know, and next thing you know, I, we're actually the worst at that because it is hard for me to get my kids to the dentist <laughs> because I'm there every day, you know. So, um, yeah, we're, we're really bad. I don't even want to tell you. I've, I've had two types of mark. Yeah, and, and even ourselves. You know, it's hard to get our own teeth clean. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's really not. Matter of fact, I know, right? Yeah, maybe I should. <laughs> you both have beautiful teeth. Oh, thank you so much. So I just wanted to show you guys this. That way you guys can see what the initial breakdown of enamel looks like, you know, to keep an eye out on how. And then, of course, this book shows, obviously, cavities that become more severe. And a, a question that I get a lot is, you know, why fix baby teeth? Um, baby teeth are actually very, very important. So for younger children, you know, in your case, if, if we see a child who does have decay on their baby teeth, we do recommend fixing them. And the reason why is because kids are resilient and they are so strong to not necessarily tell you that something hurts or they don't understand exactly what it is that hurts. You know, they, they, they complain of it, ear pain, but it's actually tooth pain that they're associating with that. Um, while permanent teeth are forming underneath, baby teeth play a huge role. Number one, they play a huge role for saving space because once you remove a baby tooth, you have to maintain that space because a permanent tooth just isn't going to come up in its place until natural eruption time. Um, but also, when, when you remove, um, you, you don't fix it, then we can, we can risk abscess and infection, and believe it or not, um, that abscess and infection can enter the bloodstream. So if we have health issues or health concerns, that just increases health concerns even more. Um, because then it can lead to the bloodstream, and, and if there's underlying heart issues or anything like that, it can actually hospitalize a child. Um, so yes, fixing baby teeth are very, very important. However, the more frequently we come to the dentist and have our preventive checkups, um, the, the easier and small it is for us to catch, and the smaller you know cavities may be, and we can treat them a lot easier. Um, does anybody have questions about <coughs> from a brushing standpoint, flossing standpoint, a diet standpoint? Something I always like to say is drink plenty of water throughout the daytime to help really rinse away, chew gum. I know we talked about this earlier. Chewing sugar-free gum during the day um, helps stimulate saliva and helps stimulate salivary flow. Um, Medical history really plays a huge concern as well because a lot of, you know, a lot of medications cause dry mouth, and if our mouth is dry, we're not producing saliva to rinse the plaque and bacteria away. That's going to put us at a higher risk um, for cavities and gingivitis. Um, so, I, I, my main point about diet and things like that is frequent snacking. If we can limit it, I like to say this. Um, you know, obviously breakfast, lunch, dinner, a snack in between, but no snacking in between the snacks. Um, and try to keep things at the table. Um, something I try to incorporate at my house is water, unless if you're sitting at the table. If you're sitting at the table for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, <coughs> then of course we can do juice, we can do a Gatorade, we can do a milk, we can do something like that. Um, but anytime that you're 
child may be off playing or whatever, um, playing games, doing, watching TV, whatever it may be, if they're thirsty in between <coughs> that time, just always have water available because that water is going to help help rinse things away. Does anybody have yes? You mentioned just any kind of carbohydrate, and my son um, eats does snack a bit, and we also use food as a reward uh -huh. to um, <coughs> reduce that. And I wanted to. And that's know, very common. You're not. You're, you're not, not allowed. Yeah. <laughs> um, like eating crackers and that kind of thing, low sugar. Is that still? Can that fit, still be a problem for tooth decay? <laughs> Allie, it eventually gets broken down from that carbohydrate into the sugar. So really, like Courtney was saying, it's still just the frequency of it. Okay. So you eat a cracker or a sweet biscuit a cookie. Yes. You know, I much rather see it be. Um, okay, let's talk. Let's talk about like different. There's there's good choices we can make. There's better choices mm -hmm. that we can make. Um, there's really bad choices we can make. Really bad choices, obviously, would be our super sticky stuff, <coughs> like our fruit roll-ups, um, our, our fruit snacks, uh, goodness, and the marketing on those things, like 100% vitamin C, maybe yeah. your fruit juice, you know, <laughs> and it's like, oh fun. my goodness, yeah, no, those are horrible. Um, so, anything sticky, general rule of thumb, if you need your fingernail to dig it out of your teeth, it's not the best snack. However, there are great snacks that actually cheese is a fabulous snack. Cheese is a neutralizing snack. So, I mean, cheese is great because it helps neutralize your mouth. <coughs> so if you're acidic and you have some cheese, you're raising it up to the level it needs to be raised at. So cheese is a great snack. Chocolate, um, dark chocolate, especially dark chocolate, because the, your, your benefits are coming from dark chocolate. <laughs> like that. Yes. <laughs> so um, I much rather see, as opposed to Skittles, I much rather see M&Ms. Um, even better, dark chocolate. Uh, because dark chocolate, there are antioxidant, um, antioxidants in the cocoa. So the darker the chocolate, the better for you. And it's actually, you know, studies are showing now that um, dark chocolate is it's more anti-cariogenic because of those benefits. Um, popcorn is a great snack. There are your crunchy foods that I like to call like detergent foods. Is that almost what yeah. you would call them? Yeah. Detergent foods where um, it cleans. So, you know, you're kind of cleaning as you're eating. So the popcorns and things like that. So crackers, you know what? It, I much rather crackers than something sticky, of yeah. course. Okay. Um, I would try to switch it up. And if you can think of something like a popcorn or a nut, um, I know there's a lot of nut allergies, so a lot of people don't do nuts. Um, your, your crunchy veggies, like your carrots and your celeries and your apples and things like that. Um, cookies. You know how Oreos will stay on your teeth forever? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have you ever noticed how your child eats an Oreo cookie yes. and then they stick in the grooves? That increases your chance for cavities. So um, there's just... There's certain things that dissolve a little bit better in the mouth and drinking water with it. But it, that's why I always like to talk about it's more the frequency mm -hmm. than actually what you're eating. It's how often you're eating it. Um, so I would say yes. You know, when we use food as a reward, as a motivator, um, if we can switch it up and think, okay, we're going to give crackers this time, but if there's another a healthy snack or a cheese that we can do after that, and so we're just, it's not consistently that formidable carbohydrate that we're giving all day long. Because um, I know a lot of uh, a lot of kids, you know, they, they walk around with their snacks, so there's a black baggie full of goldfish all day long, too, and they're just constantly just, you know, snacking on the, on the goldfish. Well, that's the frequency of it. So i much rather see... Um, sit down at the table and I eat in 10 minutes and maybe, you know, if we have to snack a lot or reward, we don't do anything for an hour, hour and a half, sit down at the table, have a snack for 10 minutes, as opposed to, I'm going to take a bite, five minutes later, I'm going to take another bite, five minutes later, I'm going to take another bite. Does that make sense? So we're not eating, taking a bite every five minutes. We're having our snack, we're having a reward, we're allowing that 20 minute time period afterwards for our mouth to neutralize back out. We're rinsing with water, we're drinking water. And then if we have another snack later, that's a much better way to approach that. Mm -hmm. Does that help answer your question a little bit?
Somewhat, yeah, thank you. It's like, you know, like, are you thinking, like, what am I going to do now? now? Like if you, <laughs> we use the food to get our kids to do stuff yeah. and to learn stuff. So it's harder to manage, but I I totally get your point. We, what, I, we had to have three and a half thousand dollars worth of dental work done on our mm -hmm. son under general anesthetic, just fixing up all his baby teeth, and I'm, sh I'm sure it was the amount of candy. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, you know, I, that, that's another one of those things where you, you, you just have to make what decision is right for you, to yeah. be honest with you. There, there's no, yes, there is a wrong to it because it, it puts at a risk. However, it's at a right because it's what works. So exactly. we're not going to slap anybody's hand for trade and it's there. just one of those yeah. things that it is what it is, you know, and it's like pick your battles. And that that would be one of those that I'm like, you know what? Teeth are fixable, you know. So if it's it's true. Uh, if we'd been at Barker, it wouldn't have happened. But <laughs> so that brings me to the next point is you know treating issues when there when there are dental concerns and there. Yes, yes but absolutely. Um, we use we don't use sugar in uh -huh. our foods. We use um, organic honey. Yes, um, but it's usually always cooked. Uh -huh. Like she has squash muffins and it's honey squash and eggs and that's it. So you know that... that's a great question. Um, there's actually some um, I have great benefits to honey as far as you know, and I don't know if you buy local honey or organic honey and things like that. But I wouldn't be so much at a concern because you're cooking the honey. It, yes, it, but it's a natural form of sugar. Um, but there's there's the the benefits of honey having the antioxidants as well, so it does not pose much of a of a concern in my eyes that you're you're doing you're using honey as a sweetener because I, I do in my household too, that's what we use as a sweetener we try we stay away from the sugars and stuff, um just make sure that you're rinsing, drinking plenty of, of water and things and, like that. And she does a lot of like she does a bunch of grape juice, but it's always. You know those big containers. It's always like a fourth of that of the juice, and then three fourths water, the rest water. So it's really Are watered you, down. Does is she drinking it all day long? I mean, does she have access to it, or is it just one? Yeah, I would try when you can to just kind of alter that habit a little bit, because even though it is watered down, I mean, there's still that sugar in there. So there's still that sugar exposure. So every time that we're taking a drink, we're still lowering the acidity in, in the mouth and making it acidic a little bit. Um, that's going to be your best option. Is if you, but I understand it gives it a hint of flavor. Um, I know I talked about earlier even the fake sugars, uh, but if you can find a flavored water, that's not the best. Plain water is the best option, but you know try to just do minimal. And I would, if you can, if you can have it to where you limit some time and just, you know, okay, from eight o'clock in the morning until ten, but I'm taking it away from ten to eleven thirty, you know, and just, you know, so try to set small goals with that, if that makes sense. Small goals. Um, again, it's one of those. I, I <coughs> it works for you, and that's great because you're only using very little amount. But if we can just get some regular water in there, just a little, or even just having a break. Say so I have a hard time when she won't drink if she doesn't have a little bit of the flavor. Of the flavor in there. And if she doesn't drink all the time. I mean, even at home. Yeah, she's her taking a break Her drink is in there. the fridge. She'll go in. She'll take a drink of it. She yeah. has to leave it in the kitchen. So. And that's a good rule. Yeah. I mean, that's a great rule. Well. That's a great rule. That's a great rule. So, you know, just monitor. Just, okay. just really monitor, okay. and um, you have to do what works for you. You know, it's one of those things that it's a give and a take type of thing. And just know that if, if we can take a break in there so we're at least yeah. allowing the mouth to neutralize back out a little bit, then there's a benefit to allowing the, the mouth to neutralize. That way it's just not staying at an acidic level. Or incorporate some cheese in there, too. <laughs> cheese doesn't that. work. Okay. No, she loves cheese. Yeah. But part of her new diet... Gluten free and, and well, she's on the SCD. Okay. Okay. Diet. Yeah. So it's basically. <laughs> well, it's yeah. a great suggestion, and I understand. Yeah, I understand <laughs> that too. I I do. You know, you start pulling things out of the diet yeah. and stuff. So. We're gonna try that one back though, because that was her favorite. Was 
Um, do you have any other recommendations? I mean, yogurt's kind of a benefit if you're taking yes. dairy. No, and I was going to say, you know, I don't know, a, a Greek yogurt is kind of more of a cleaner option, mm -hmm. um, but yes, yeah, soy cheese, absolutely, is, would be as well. Any other questions in, in relevance to diet or brushing or flossing? Um, goodness, I, I know we've touched base on a lot. I, I want you guys, you know, to feel free and ask questions. Dental treatment wise, dental treatment in the office, most important thing, going in every six months. If we make the recommendation to come in for that well visit, we do it at our office. And especially if that's something that you feel that would work for your child, let us know. We are open to what works for you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, we want the suggestions and the recommendations from parents and the tips. Um, and then we can add tips onto that, you know, and tricks. The good thing about pediatric dentists is pediatric dentists have a lot more training. They, they actually, they go to training, additional training for at least two years, um, learning how to work with children and adults with um, special health care needs, with sensory issues, and they get that additional training. So pediatric dentists versus general dentists, you know, who I would go to, there's just a, there's, there's more training, the staff gets trained by the pediatric dentist to be able to handle certain circumstances, to be able to handle certain behaviors in the behavior management, um, to be able to provide a lot of tips and, and tricks. And we do things a lot differently um, at a pediatric dentist. For younger children, we'll do the, the lap to lap, knee to knee. We allow the parents there. We want them in your lap so they feel comforted, so that, that parental comfort is always near. Um, at our office, we allow parents back for every procedure, unless if it is more like a sedation. Um, has anybody, well, I know you said that your child was under general anesthesia. Was that more like in a hospital setting? It was a day procedure. Yeah. And okay. it was a, it was like a project, you know. What else do we want to do while you're under <laughs> general anesthesia? Right. Do, do, do we need to have any else? Yeah. Yeah. Do we need to have yeah. 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 And you know what, that pans out great because we do some general anesthesia at our office. We really try to do a lot in office um, for several reasons. Well, number one, your child will be familiar with the faces that are there. So there's that familiar, you know, being, being familiar. If things are too extreme or there's really um, the behavior, um, I don't want to say behavior issues by any means, but if you know if, if there's yeah. harm themselves, yes, to where it's it's going to pose more of a threat. Safety is our number one concern. Um, so we we will do everything in our office unless if we feel that there's a safety issue, if there's a severe health risk, or if you know somebody is just um, too combative that it's like you know it's not worth it. It's not worth it to do it here. It's so much better just to take the two seconds. Of, of the general anesthesia and we'll just get that done, they're gonna wake up and not remember anything. But we do take a lot of um, a lot of pride in the fact that we we like to work with every child. Every child has certain needs that are different. And, you know, from from an 18 month old to our adult patients that we see at our office we will see adult patients with special health care needs forever. Um, we do. So mm -hmm. they don't age out. No. They don't. Okay. No, no. Um, we work with um, ch children through college until they make a decision. We try to make it convenient because obviously our hours, our busiest time is whenever the college breaks, the spring breaks, the summer breaks, and things like that. So that's when we really maximize our schedule. And that's when we're, we're, we maximize our staff because we, we understand and we know. Um, so we typically um, will start referring out to a general dentist. However, if there is a, is a, a child, teenager, adult with a special health care need, they are welcome to stay at our office forever. We have days where um, we even work, we will close our office uh, and we work with several group homes um, and we bring in 
45, 50, 60 year olds, and we take care of them at our office as well. So yes, they do not, we, we do not need to worry about aging out. If your comfort level is there, then you guys at our office can remain as, as a patient with us. And then if there's ever any where we think that we've graduated, then we can definitely find a great fit for, for you know, your child's personality, um, their specific needs, what you guys are seeking. Um, but no, don't reach out. Does anybody have questions about treatment in the dental office? Yes. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. My son need, will need to have his wisdom teeth removed. And I'd like Unfortunately, to, we don't take care of that at our office. However, okay. um, you are an existing patient. Yeah. And uh, we have a great oral surgeon that we refer to, Dr. Garrison and Dr. Partridge, which is right on 96th Street. I don't know if you guys are familiar. I don't know. <laughs> and they, <laughs> they are fabulous. And actually, um, we work it out quite often that if any other work needs to be done, we we have privileges there with them, so we'll go there and do the work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. So, hey, did you I have totally to forgot what I was doing? Oh, no, no, that's okay. So, <coughs> if you don't do it in your office, then where do you do it? Typically, Riley. Riley Hospital downtown. We do a lot in our office. Okay. Um, <laughs> we Because I know I just can't see her sitting still. And a lot of parents can't. A lot of parents can't. And that's Doing, why it's... And she um, was there before. She's been at your office. Okay. But it was... A long time ago. Yeah. Um, that is where the frequent every three month visit. And I know that sounds like, oh my goodness, how am I going to get there every three months? Like, really? You're asking me to do that. But there is a, there is a huge benefit to that. It's just becoming familiar. It's just like, you know, having certain training every day. And working on certain skills every day. That eventually it becomes... Not, not routine, but like, okay, I've been here before. I've seen this face before. And if you have a preference of sticking with the same staff, please speak up at our office and just be like, I always want her because I've been here and been with her. You know, I don't. We do have a very large staff. Are we all skilled the same way? Yes. You know, every I don't credit one hygienist higher than another. We all have had the same training. Um, however, I understand the importance of just sticking with the same person for that familiarity of it. Um, we work with children and and you know teenagers and adults that that need that extra work to be able to make them feel comfortable. The different techniques, the tell show do. If we need to move forward with any type of procedure to help decrease anxiety, we offer different sedation levels in our office, whether it be nitrous, but I can tell you sometimes that nitrous nose on the face isn't gonna cut it. I mean, it's just not happening. <laughs> you know, once the, no, it's just not happening. Um, oral sedation um, and doing more of that mild sedation with different medications that are very safe. Um, we, we have a couple different medications that we use depending on the amount of treatment that we need done so short short acting um, or if we need you know that longer time frame to get stuff done that is an option we have um, dr. Walker has rights dr. Benson has uh, rights and we do do OR cases at Riley if, if that is you know something that is needed um, sometimes just that that tell show do some sometimes if, in an emergency situation do it, you know, and it's like if we can have a parent's help and a parent stand there and help coach the child and and it's okay and I'm right here and I know it's uncomfortable and we can just make it through that five minutes just to get it done. Sometimes it's best just to do it that way and then, you know. I think um, I'm thinking x-rays. I don't know how she would. And, and you know, as long as x-rays once a year are typical standard to do an x-rays. I can tell you personally I have several patients that as long, if, if there is an issue with taking x-rays and we cannot get them done, if there is no issues that we see clinically, okay, we can wait till next time. Um, it's just really one of those things of sticking with the same clinician, mm -hmm. you know, the same hygienist and the same assistant. And then 
also to the perks of if we know we're seeing a patient frequently, we can maybe just work on one x-ray, one visit. But if we know we're seeing you back again for just an evaluate, let's just try one as opposed to saying, okay, today we've got to do an exam, we're going to brush, we're going to clean, we're going to do this, we're going to do four, we're going to take x-rays, we're going to take a new You know, all this stuff that we're trying to catch up on to where if we have more frequent visits, we are more apt to spread things out a little bit and, and just have many goals. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so today we're going to sit in the chair and maybe just count our fingers and touch our teeth with the explorer. In a couple months, we're going to come back and we're going to sit in the chair, count our fingers, count our teeth. Now we're going to polish the fingers and maybe polish the teeth. So we set those mini goals that are needed. And like I said, a lot of that we take into consideration once we're able to assess our patient and the child um, and, and start that communication, you know, and just gaining that trust. It's all about gaining the trust, really. It is. And that's another reason why it's really important to stick with the same clinician is because you're, you're gaining a trust and vice versa. I'm trusting that, you know, as a patient, you're not going to harm me if I try things. You're realizing that I'm not going to harm you by trying things as well. That doesn't make sense. So there are small goals that we can make. And, and if you're that's good what, with having other people in if she's not that. Yes, not yes, absolutely. Okay. And we okay. encourage that. We encourage a parent to be right there and just to have that parental comfort. And um, sometimes we even ask parents to help. You know, if you, like, oh, okay. I really see this area that we need to get this x-ray of, and I yeah. just want to take one x-ray. So if you don't mind being right here by the chair and hold her hand and wearing a lead apron. A lot of times we have lead aprons, we have weighted blankets, we have bean bags that we can fit in our chair. Whatever makes them feel comfortable, we really try to figure out what makes a child feel comfortable. Um, so there's different approaches that we can take. Some children don't want anything on them. Some children like the comfort to feel that weight and to feel secure and it just, it really brings out, you know, a sense of, of being secure. So it's a lot of communication with a parent, um, but also the frequency of being able to have that one-on-one -on -one appointment time with the child um, that we're going to learn more. Yes. My son had an appointment and it was during the therapy session and the, I was able to pick him up, pick up Jimmy and the therapist right. and we both, and we all three of us right. went mm -hmm. to the appointment. See that's what I'm, I'm thinking. I mean yeah. we do that. We just went today for an gynecology appointment with her and they were there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. Please, I mean call and, 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 and do that and allow us okay. to work and we are very open, and but we don't know if we don't have that communication from a parent. So if you have suggestions yeah. on, you know, here's here's our needs, and how can you accommodate those needs? Um, that's what we're here for, is to accommodate to the best of our availability. I know my child doesn't like to lay down. She doesn't like to go all the way down. She and and we can start with her sitting down slowly. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and I was going to say, I'm working with a patient right now where the dad comes, but also two therapists come with and it started where he wouldn't even get in the chair or anything it was terrified and I worked with him you know I, I did it a couple days in a row to keep him familiar with me and I mean he just would cry when he walked through the door and now he'll walk in he knows me we go back to the room he's still not laying back but I'm cleaning his teeth sitting up and I mean the and sitting up just like this yeah. I mean we will get ourselves in the position <laughs> and we will yes. do this yes I okay. have actually I know this sounds crazy but exactly what Ali says, we do whatever we can, but we need the communication from parents to tell us. Otherwise, we're, think, we're thinking, okay, let's go back to the chair, let's lay down. You know, so as long as we have that open communication in any direction, we welcome from parents. Like, please let us know what works and what doesn't work. Please let us know your past experiences, what works. And then let us, you know, let us kind of take that and, and figure out how the appointment's going to go. I have physically taken a tray and a portable toothbrush. I have went and cleaned teeth in the car. <laughs> because <laughs> that's where the patient was, was yeah. felt comfortable with the seatbelt on. So I climbed in the back seat and the child was sitting in, well, not child, what teenager was sitting in the front seat and I climbed in the back seat and I just put my foot up on that middle rest and I just got in here like this. And that's how we did our exam. That is how we did our cleaning, and that was it. Were we getting x-rays? 
Nope. And that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. You know what? We made progress. I cleaned your teeth. It was in a car, but we did it. So that was a joke for a really long time because we do have a garage in our building. And I was like, you know, we're just going to start doing drive through dentistry. <laughs> you know? um, but we will accommodate. We will. Whatever is going to work, we'll find a way. I have a question. Yes. Really quick. Is it okay for our families just to stop by and actually see the yes. facility? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So they could call in yeah. and, and just be like, like, hey, I just want my kiddo to just check to it see out. it. Absolutely. Even if and I tell like you, I really encourage, I really encourage for um, a parent, you know, if you guys do call to stop in and, and if you're making yeah. that recommendation, call to stop in, number one, we'll mm -hmm. always try to have somebody to give a quick tour mm -hmm. because that's going to be the initial phase. However, I don't want to give a quick tour in a time where we're super, super busy right. and it could be potentially very loud right. and it could be a bad thing. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But yes, okay. I welcome that. Come take a tour. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can we can try to find a time. Mm -hmm. um, so they could just call ahead or yeah. we call ahead. And just like, yes. Any other questions? Yes. So my son so far has no cavities, mm -hmm. but it, I'm sure the day will come that he'll get a cavity. My daughter so does too, but it's okay. I do, do, do I prepare him beforehand? Like, is there a book or something? I don't, I don't want to scare him with, like, scary books about, you know what I mean? Yeah, and thank you. That's the right thing to do. Don't don't say any scary words like, oh, you know, well, we might have to give a shot, and then all of a sudden they picture a needle, because we have very... Um, we use distraction techniques. We do what we call a tell, show, do technique. So in that case, um, hopefully what our staff is doing <laughs> is they would be prepping a little bit, like let me show you what we're gonna use on your fingers for your next appointment. Um, and even, maybe it might not be done at that initial di diagnostic appointment where, oh, your son has cavities, we're gonna bring him back. But before that appointment, yes, prepare. Just be like, we're going to chase away the sugar bugs, and it's just like when they clean their teeth with a special toothbrush, and it's going to chase away the sugar bugs, and then they're going to put a special star in your tooth, um, or, you know, whatever it may be, whether it be a Spider-Man star, you know, whatever, um, whatever they like, so it's cool, you yeah. know. Um, I've let us do the work in a sense of, you know, this is our toothbrush, because we will actually show them on the fingers, and it doesn't hurt, I mean, Everybody calls it a drill, so I'll reference a drill, but we don't ever say drill to a child. We say Mr. Whistle. Everything has a Mr. name. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Mr. Whistle or Mr. Bumpy, and, and you know, it bumps, and we will I physically show them, like, let me do your fingernail. We will hold the exact same thing that we're just about to put in a tube. Let me hold it on your fingernail. We will do their fingernail so they can feel it. See, that's not hurting your fingernail. It's not going to hurt your tooth. In the case that we do have to numb up or give an injection, never see shot. Um, we always try to use the nitrous nose. If we can use a little bit of nitrous, the good thing about that nose is it's huge and it's right here, so it's blocking their vision of what's going on. That when we do come around, we come from the underside to go in to give an injection. So they see nothing because they're laying back with this big nose and we're coming this way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so we're not going across the eyeballs with it or anything like that. Um, <laughs> do, you not, so, do you not use the like, numbing gel? We do. We, do. we use that first. Yeah, yeah. The topical anesthetic, we do. We use that first. Um, so if we, we do that before we even have to try to numb. And with that, we call that sleepy jelly that we're just going to rub with some jelly on there. Um, you know, so it looks like jelly. It looks like jelly in the fridge. And so we just, you know, we try different things. And if we're like, I don't like jelly, then we call it something else. So we can not diagnose the cavity and then do it the same day? No. Because I imagine he will freak we out. We can. So if, if, you know, we, we do have those parents that if we have an opening in the schedule and they prefer it be done, we will see what we can do. Is that our typical protocol? No, we will prepare you, we will go over the treatment, we will allow you guys to prepare at home, and then we will definitely make sure that we are, are allowing enough time to utilize our tell, show, do techniques and things like that so we can get the treatment done. Um, one thing I, I did bring, how are we on time? 707? Oh, goodness, I'm so sorry. Oh, well, I should right. probably wrap it. so good. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I know. I, I do have to pick my daughter up at 8, so I'm good for about another 20 minutes. So I'll make sure and allow enough time at the end. But here's another thing. Take my card. 
before we leave, take our brochure. This is a tooth eruption. This might be great for you so you know if, if ever mouth pain or anything, you know about what age teeth are erupting, okay? Um, with also some tips, but and this is a magnet that you can put on a fridge, so in case of an emergency, you can just, this actually has our after hours emergency line on it, which is physically one of us. So it's not like you're sent to a call center. It is one of us who we're on call. It's always a, an assistant or a hygienist, um, so we can help you. Um, but I wanted I wanted to bring something really quick to talk about. Um, you know how we talk about weighted blankets and lead aprons and stuff like that. Yeah, I, safety is our number one concern, and we do have to monitor. So if we go into more of a sedation in our office, we monitor a child heavily. Um, if we're given any type of medication besides just nitrous, um, nitrous is you know, it is a very light sedative, but if we give any type of medication, whether it be like an oral medication, we can give medication intranasally, which is where it's like a mist. So if, if your child's not very good at taking oral medication, but we know that we want to do a sedation to help help ease the anxiety, kind of get them relaxed a little bit to get more done, um, we can do intranasally and, and um, do that as well. But we do monitor, so we monitor blood pressure Sometimes we'll monitor with an EKG. I know that sounds kind of crazy uh, for a dental office, but it's just one step ahead that we do that we're not required to do, that hardly anybody does. We're all moms, and I, as a mom, want to know that the patient's safe, and I want you guys as moms to know that your child is safe. Um, the EKG is for us to really just monitor the, the, um, the, heart, the heartbeat and monitor, you know, Ways. Um, also using a precordial stethoscope. So, you know, your we may place the pads on your child, and before any of this is done during a sedation, we review this with you and let you know, you know, we are going to place patches on, on your child to monitor with an EKG, but also um, we use a precordial stethoscope, which is just going another step above and beyond for safety, and the doctor wears an earpiece so she can actually listen to everything. So, um, Sedations in office are very, very safe, um, and we take the safety just up to the next level, just just because, I, I mean, it's just, you have to, you know, we, we want to. That's our number one concern and priority is, is a child safety. Um, we also require three trained sedation employees to be in the room at all times with the patient on the train. Okay. So I know that there's always questions with parents because that's the one procedure that we ask parents to wait in the waiting room, but it's because if we are giving your child a sedative to help relax them, to ease anxiety so we can do treatment and get cavities filled, we need to be focused 100%. And we don't want the child to be distracted, not allowing the medication to work to the fullest, because mom's sitting over there in the corner and all they want is to be coddled and to be comforted by mom. It's, it's worse, really. It's, Toward from them because they see mom and their mom, you know, they, they want they want that comfort, they feel weird, they're on medication, and we're trying to get them to relax and calm down, and we dim the lights, and sometimes we play soft music, and so, or we have cartoons going, and things like that, so I know a lot of parents have concerns about sedation. I have a question sure. about the, like the nitrous oxide or the yes. sedation, does it actually, is it pain relief? For the child, or is it the nitrous oxide? Actually, kind of is. It works as an analgesic as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so that's why we like to use nitrous just for regular filling appointments. When whenever we do fillings, because the nitrous it works as an analgesic, so it helps reduce any type of pain. So when we actually do the injection, it's working as an analgesic. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, a lot of times, kids don't even notice that. They because their whole nitrous. body feels numb. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, their whole body feels kind of tingly and numb and, and a little weird. Okay. So, but we always mix our nitrous with oxygen. So know that they're always getting oxygen as well. It's not like full of nitrous. Um, it's 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 a mixture of nitrous and oxygen. And with the sedation, I brought one thing, and this is a patient stabilizer. Now a lot of parents have questions about this. If we ever say that we have like um, for safety purposes, um, like a little Velcro blanket. This sometimes we do, we 
do use, this is obviously a very small one, but we lay it flat on the chair. And because we monitor with the blood pressure, if somebody's moving their arm all the time, I'm not getting good reading. So we we'll put their arm straight and just Velcro this over to help keep their arm tight so it's still. So we're getting an accurate reading and also keeping them safe. Because if children fall asleep, a lot of times they don't like to sleep flat on their back. They like to roll over to their side. Does that make sense? So a lot of the, I, I wanted to bring this to show you guys that if we ever say patient um, stabilizer, it's helping stable and keep everything stable so we can, number one, safety, um, so we can monitor. And um, I mean, this is, it, it's common, commonly used, but a lot of parents are kind of misled by a visual of it. Like it's just a mesh, like little sleeping bag almost. But a lot of times children feel secure too, just because they, they feel like they're being held and and not so, you know, yes, if that makes sense. So, and sometimes we will use that in conjunction with like a lead blanket. We have a lead blanket that if we find that they like that security, um, we, we have lead blanket um, or a lead apron. The lead apron is what you wear whenever you get x-rays taken. It's just a little weighted blanket. Um, I should say weighted. Is for x-rays that we can use that too and uh, we have like bean bags that we can help so it's nice and soft and warm up your own bed. Do you have a cocoon? Um, yeah, sometimes and this really helps. Right. This really helps with that you know the, the cocoon and it, if we even find that you know they like um, a child likes their legs as well I mean we can we have longer ones that we can use too. Um, and if they want a blanket we have blankets any other questions? I can talk and talk and talk. So I'm so sorry. I can't be here so late. Yes, you're welcome. Feel free at any time. Um, if you have questions after, take here, I'll just kind of pass these around. Don't hesitate to email me. That's what we're here for.